Poker's legendary champions, next generation stars, and tireless ambassadors of the game, sharing their wisdom and guiding your journey to high achievement on the green felt. This is Chasing Poker Greatness with your host, Brad Wilson. Well, hello there, my pretties, and welcome to another episode of the Chasing Poker Greatness podcast. As always, this is your host, the founder of ChasingPokerGreatness.com, Brad Wilson, and today's guest is a mindset expert, author, and podcaster, Dr. Tricia Cardner. I feel like a broken record in these intros sometimes with how much these conversations mean to me. But I am just consistently blown away by how amazing the human beings who make up the world of poker are, and Trisha Cardner is no exception. Trisha is engaging, hilarious, an amazing storyteller, and can't help but drop greatness bomb after greatness bomb every time she opens her mouth. Our conversation ranges from her childhood dreams, a hilarious story about past chasing poker greatness guest Fedor Holtz, And of course, a ton about one of my favorite topics in the world, mindset. If you love my past episodes with folks like Nick Howard, Elliot Rowe, and Jared Tindler as much as I do, you ought to be feeling very excited right about now. In today's episode, you're going to learn some reasons why you know in your heart of hearts you should be folding, but then you have an out-of-body experience and what yourself call instead a greatness bomb that will make you want to pay much closer attention to your emotions, some quick and easy ways you can improve your mindset, and much, much more. And before you dive into my conversation with Trisha, I wanted to take a moment and let you know that this interview is brought to you by Poker with Presence. If you want to get in the zone and play your best when you need it the most, visit PokerWithPresence.com. And now, without any further ado... I bring to you the mind wizard herself, Dr. Trisha Cardner. Trisha, welcome to the Chasing Poker Greatness podcast. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for having me on. It's my pleasure. I've been looking forward to having this conversation. And All right. as I normally like to do, actually, I'm going to start out a little different. Test out a question I've been tinkering with. What's something interesting about you that a lot of people might not know? Hmm. Wow. That, that's a question that I wasn't prepared to answer. Um, I don't know how interesting it is, but I think it's kind of uh, fun. I often joke, and, and your listeners might not have even heard this, but amongst my own friends, I'll joke that I'm going to write a book called From GED to PhD in Five Easy Steps. And that's because I actually do have a GED. I did not finish high school. Really? So that's Tell a little me, fun factoid, right? That is a fun factoid. How did you go <laughs> from not finishing high school to getting a PhD? Uh, well, it's kind of, even though I said it was five easy steps, you know, maybe <laughs> it was a little more convoluted than that. But uh, yeah, I had I had some difficulty um, in high school. And so it just really was not for me. So I was like, meh, I don't have time for this. And so the principal and I kind of, I think he, he thought it, it was more his idea, right. That I just go away, you know, don't go away, mad, just go away. But I was great with it. So uh, I left, I commenced over, I had a community college in my town and I went over there, made an appointment with the Dean and said, Hey, um, yeah, I haven't finished high school and I'm really not into it. And I just like to start college. And he could sign for, um, I can't remember, they had a name for it. But anyway, he could approve it. And he thought it was the funniest story he ever heard. And so he he signed on and I started college. There you go. (laughs) How did your parents feel about that? They okay with it? Uh, Well, my mom, actually, she was kind of part of the, what was the reasoning for all this? Because she was moving around quite a lot. And I had already been in... uh, I don't know, three or four different high schools. And I said, you know what? I'm just not doing this anymore. Uh, you go on. So she was actually in another state when all this went down. Uh, and she'll tell you 
that I was like a grown up at two years old. Like I knew my own mind. <laughs> so yeah, I, I think it turned out okay though. To yeah, be fair. it worked out. It's, it appears as if it has worked <laughs> out pretty well. <laughs> you know, and the funny thing was, I didn't really have anybody in my family who had even gone to any level of higher education, but even as a teen, I was just very fixated on this idea that I wanted to get a PhD in psychology. So I was really into what makes people tick from the time I was a really small child. And so I just had the idea that I wanted to do it. And, and that's why? it. Yo. Why, why was that such a, <laughs> such a strong pull into understanding how people tick? Why, why did that resonate with you? I wish I could answer you, but I can remember being five or six years old and just wondering why people did what they did. And when I was about five, my mom had my sister and my mom had, um, I don't know, somebody had given her one of those baby books, you know, that you get it, tell you how to raise your kid or whatever. And I'm like five years old and I read this book <laughs> and, it, and it was super thick and it had like really tiny print and, uh, you know, Obviously, I was weird. What can I say? <laughs> but I just wanted to know, like, why people do what they do. And the more weird and strange, like, the better, as far as I was concerned. Yeah, mindset is a fascinating <laughs> topic. Mm -hmm. I do mindset sessions with my students on a fairly regular basis. And it's very interesting, the human mind, how mm -hmm. it navigates through different scenarios. Just today, I did uh, an optimization session with one of my students and he had a problem, which is kind of funny. And he would kill me uh, if I were to release his name publicly, but <laughs> he's been running hot. Mm -hmm. He's been crushing it and he's been feeling pressure on the inside of waiting for the other shoe to drop inevitably to the point to where he lost an all in, like it was ace king against Queens and the dude spiked an ace on the river and he actually felt relieved because he lost the pot because he wasn't <laughs> running as hot as he was, which if you really think about that is quite fascinating. Like these are the kind of things that wake me up in the morning trying to solve these complicated issues of how human beings are navigating the world. You know, it's real interesting because the brain is wired to look for patterns and to suss them out. And we're going to look for one or patterns, pattern, I don't know if it's singular or plural, depends on the situation, but it's going to look for a pattern and tell a story, a narrative to make it, you know, make the data fit that pattern that it thinks is there. It wants to be there, you know? So it's very interesting that uh, his pressure valve was such that he just was like, oh, how can I, you know, release this and not have so much pressure on me? Yeah, exactly. It was super interesting. And it's a thing that I've experienced too. As I've mm -hmm. played poker for a long time, you're in the downswing and you think, oh, it's never going to end. There's no hope. And you're on an upswing and you're like scared because you're like, oh, when's it all going to fall apart? When When's my downswing coming? I know it's coming any day now. Um, yeah. I think with poker, you have the confounding variable of money and the way that the mind interacts with money. Because when you were saying that, it just made me think like, you know, when Steph Curry has got the hot hand and he's just shooting three pointer after three pointer, I don't think he thinks, and I don't know this cause I haven't talked to him, but you know, I'll send him a message and see if he gets back to me. <laughs> yeah. Good luck. <laughs> but what you right. When he's thinking those, I don't think he goes like, man, I hope this streak doesn't end. And maybe I should sabotage myself in some way so that it does end. Not that your client sabotage himself. Cause the ace king versus Queens is like totally standard. But some people will sabotage themselves, right? But I think it has more to do um, around some of the issues with money and the way the brain interacts with money. And, you know, when you lose money, the pain centers of the brain will actually light up if we have you, you know, in the MRI, CAT scan, that sort of thing, and we can look at what's going on. So I think maybe that's a thing because I know if my guess is right about Steph, he's not like, oh shit, this is going to end. I think he's, he's like so supremely confident and well-trained that he is probably surprised when he doesn't hit it. Yeah. I mean, all these guys that are making, you know, 30, $40 million a year, they've got just 
so many different coaches who are yeah. helping them on yeah. every aspect of their game. It's kind of like an NFL kicker, right? Like he misses two field goals in a row. You know that that kicker has a mental game coach. He has a lot oh, of yeah. coaches that are helping him to just reset focus on the moment, stay present, don't dwell on the the past misses and, you know, just perform to the best of your ability. But mm-hmm. all of these things have this element of mental game and mindset that has to be addressed. It just has to be because it's such a part of being a human being. Yeah. I think the other thing with poker players, and this is probably true in other realms as well, because I've worked with athletes and business executives and, and the like too, but a lot of people don't want to put in the effort until they've really driven the car off in the ditch. So it has to have gotten really bad before I go, Oh, you know what? Maybe I do need to talk to a mindset coach or a psychologist or whatever. Right. When in reality, if you would get everything in order and be operating, you know, on all cylinders at the get go or from early on, I think you'd be better off because you'd have a much smoother journey as it were yeah people don't want to go to the doctor until they're sick right exactly uh, they don't want to they don't want to solve that pain point until they actually feel the pain so most people that come to me are typically at the bottom of a downswing they are Mm -hmm. at the point to where they're like i need to pay somebody money to help me resolve (laughs) all of these issues because i'm not getting out of it myself right and before we get into the weeds too much or too far ahead of ourselves because of my introductory question there. I want to know, I want to know your story of how you got involved with playing cards. You alluded to wanting to, you know, understand how human beings think at an early age. How did you segue into the poker world? I'll tell you up until a certain point, I really had no awareness of poker at all, but I ended up around, I'd say 2006 I, another long secured as tell, but I ended up living in Cheyenne, Wyoming, and there's not a lot going on there. And so in about 06, you know, the poker boom was going, right? And so people were like, oh, we're going to have this, you know, poker game and we're going to play at home, you know, just in the basement or whatever. I was like, all right, you know, I have nothing better to do. (laughs) How how old are you in 2006? God, I don't know. You're asking me to do math. Uh, (laughs) I wasn't 21. I'll just put it that way. But, uh, you know, I, gosh, I'm like, I should do, I don't know. I don't remember. I'm just trying to get the timeline. 30-ish. 30-ish, okay. I'm just trying to get the timeline down. So um, then I go to the house party and these guys, they all worked with my husband. They were in the military. And I swear to God, they all thought they were the next Bill Home Youth in the making, right? Which is ridiculous. High and aspirations. Fact, there was one guy in the group. His name is Will. And I I used to call him Will Muth. So, uh, <laughs> and I think it would please him to no end, right? <laughs> but anyway, so we sit down to play the game. And I'm like, oh, okay, I see. This is math, you know, statistics, right? And it's psychology. And I was like, oh, yeah, I think I could definitely do this. So about that time, there really weren't, you know, you had your super system. Bill Helmuth had written a book. I don't remember which one, but you'll probably remember it. Play poker like the pros, I believe. Where he has the the eagles and the... Yeah, 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 exactly. Exactly. It was like, oh, you're the sewer rat. You're (laughs) the (laughs) whatever, right? Right. And, uh... We had that book, as a matter of fact, and I just remember I read like a few pages of it and no offense to Phil, but I was like, yeah, this is garbage. And I just chucked that away. But I went looking and it wasn't that far after that, that Harrington started coming out with his books. And I just thought they were magical. You know, I was into it. I was like, this is my jam. Let's get this party started. Let's go. And uh, so that's kind of how I got into it. And so Harrington, his Mm -hmm. workbook style of describing a situation, asking relevant questions and forcing you to use your mind to kind of navigate Mm -hmm. through, you fall in love with the game of poker. And then what happened next in your poker journey? I mean, like everybody, I was playing online in those days and Full Tilt was my site of choice. 
Yeah, and of course, I think we all know how that turned out. Yeah, um, not good. No, no, not good. But I was, you know, I played a lot more online in those days than I did live, but I appreciated and enjoyed the live probably more in a way, just because when you're live and you can see somebody, if you have psychological skills, you can really put them to use. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because you can tell what a person is feeling at the table or, you know, you can suss out some sort of weakness and you can just go for the jugular. And I love, you know, mind games and playing mind games at the table as a woman is, you know, it's just like the best thing ever as far <laughs> as I'm concerned. <laughs> right. Yeah. So I guess um, I had written a dissertation and I'm trying to remember, you know, time goes by but I believe the title was ironically peak poker performance and it was a qualitative case study the qualitative case study I'm sure of so I already had a PhD I went for a second doctoral degree and uh, my first PhD is actually in criminology and then the second one is in psychology and so because I had already done a PhD and done a really boring dissertation so my first dissertation had to do with multicultural counseling competencies of probation officers. Talk about a cure for uh, insomnia. That'd be it. <laughs> yeah, no follow-up questions for me on that. No, no, no. Right. <laughs> but then when I was doing the second one, I was in a different situation because I already had a PhD. So, you know, kind of the purpose of making you do a dissertation is to show that you know how to do research design and data collection and statistics and all that nonsense. So anyway, I, I mean, nonsense, I mean, very important. Sorry. Um, <laughs> but so I had already done that. So it wasn't like I, you know, needed to prove something to my committee on that front. So I wanted to do something fun. And I said, well, I'm real into poker, you know, and this was maybe 2010, maybe 2011, something like that. And uh, so I said, I want to do something with poker. And my dissertation chair was like, oh, absolutely not. You know, that's a horrible idea. Why? Well, I'll tell you why. Because his father had been a gambling addict. And so he had like a bias about it, right? Sure. So I said to him, I want you to watch some poker, right? Because, you know, in those days, it was all over the TV. And so I said, watch some, watch some of the WPTs, you know, the WSOPs. Um, here's some links to some YouTube, you know, go watch it. And then if afterwards you think that there is not a strong psychological component that we should be looking at, you know, aside from any gambling issues, then I'll just give up the whole notion and I'll, well, I'll do something boring, but I knew I wasn't going to give up the notion. I knew. So he uh, takes the assignment, which is very nice. And uh, he watched some of it. And then the next time we met up like a week or two later, he was like, oh yeah, I totally see what you mean. It's like really different than what I had thought. And I think that's true for a lot of people who are not inside poker. You know, they kind of have an idea about it. Like it's roulette or craps or something like that. So he was on board. And what I did for that dissertation is I actually interviewed quite a number of uh, seven figure poker winners, uh, MTTs, because that's the easiest way to, you know, get some data. And believe me, I know full well that just because you have a million in earnings doesn't mean you have a million in earnings. I know all that, but you have to have what can you do? Right. You, you can't you have you're to just have take somebody's word for it who plays cash games or you can look <laughs> at something. Well, you have to have something for purposes of doing the research, right? I, I can't just say, yeah, well, like he told me, okay? You know, <laughs> I have to have something that I can pull from. So like a Hendon mob or something. So I can say like, okay, here we go. But anyway, um, so I interviewed a number of these players. And it's real interesting because some of them have gone on and earned, you know, multiple more seven figures since then. And uh, one or two of them is, I would say, probably not playing anymore because Black Friday happened you know, in 2011, right? And so I did all this before Black Friday, but then Black Friday hit and for a lot of people, maybe they weren't in a position. I won't say a lot of people, but some people, they weren't in a position where they're like, oh, I'm going to move to Mexico or I'm going to move to Canada or whatever. So uh, anyway, the, but the point of the dissertation was to get their feedback and to ask them, you know, I had lengthy interviews 
which were then coded and dissected and all this, where I was asking about what they believe were the mental game, psychological, you know, driver skills, traits, abilities that led them to be a success in poker. That's super interesting. And I think about it back then as, you know, Black Friday is almost for people who are immersed in the world of poker, it's like your BCAD moment, right? It's like the (laughs) line in the sand where there's poker pre-Black Friday and then poker post-Black Friday. It was such a shock Mm -hmm. to the poker world. And, you know, the effects are still felt to this day that it's totally understandable. You know, the first time I went to commerce and played, I was playing and we got to talking about, uh, this was the first time I went to commerce post Black Friday, I should say. Okay. And I'm sitting at the table, I'm playing 10, 20, no limit, having conversations with these young kids. And I realized that three of them, we learn, we play against each other on online poker regularly. Um, we know each other's screen names, we've chatted, like we have a, you know, we have a history. And mm-hmm. After that time, I continued to go to commerce very regularly for a number of years. I never saw any of them again after that. They just kind of disappeared. That was like online poker went away. They tested out live poker. Apparently, they didn't really love it, and they just kind of disappeared into the wind. I don't know what happened to them, if they still play poker or not. But yeah, it's not surprising that even some of the biggest winners at that time Mm -hmm. would just disappear out of the poker spotlight because it, it, it was a big deal Black yeah Friday. it was huge and it's interesting because you know I remember I got up on Black Friday and I had the DOJ screen right and I was like oh you know the shit oh, yeah. has hit the fan <laughs> yeah right? I, I was at a flag football tournament down in Florida and I was I played a game and I went to check my phone after the game, and I had like 15 text messages from people I never communicate with asking if I'm okay. And I'm like, did a plane go down? <laughs> like, what has happened? Right? Um, because it was all over ESPN. I mean, it was major, major news um, in the country. And uh, how did that affect you know your dissertation? How did that affect your research and all of that? Well, my dissertation was done before then. Okay, it was so done. It was done. Um, yeah, done, defended, blessed, certified. So that worked out, you know, just fine for me. And I can remember, um, you know, Black Friday, of course, it was April. And then I was at the series, you know, the end of May, you know, right after that. So for all intents and purposes, it, you know, I just kept right on rolling. I just couldn't play online anymore, um, you know, for all intents and purposes. But I had the idea that I wanted to, um, basically translate the dissertation into a book because anybody who's ever had the wherewithal to go and, you know, get a dissertation, get them out of the library, right. And read them. You'll know that like, Ooh, that's a, that's a hard snooze fest because, you know, it's the whole setup and here's the research questions and here's the design and you got to wade through all that. You got to wade through all the literature review. And of course with uh, doing a poker dissertation, there really wasn't any literature, right. So I had to draw all that literature from uh, the sports psychology literature, positive psychology literature, you know, all those other things. But uh, it's a snooze fest. So I wanted to turn it into a book. And uh, I had done a little bit of work with Jonathan Little in terms of getting some coaching from him. So yeah, I was just like, hey, I wonder, would you be interested in, you know, working on this project with me? And of course, you know, I've got like 90% of it done. But anyway, <laughs> yeah, he, he was into it. So I got him to sign on and do that. And I mean, how many books has he published now? I don't know, like 14 or I think it is 14 yeah. and also the audio books. And every time I think about Jonathan Little, I actually make content for pokercoaching.com now. But when I think of him, mm-hmm. I just think about all of the things that he's done. I think on Twitter one time I, I retweeted, I was like, dude, when do you sleep? And he's like, <laughs> He's like, I sleep just fine. I just don't have any hobbies. <laughs> and like, it, I it think admit- that's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he just li- lives, sleeps, eats, and breathes poker all mm. of the time. It's very impressive, the number, you know, just the sheer volume of content, yeah. books, all the things that he's able to put out on really just a day-to-day basis. But Yeah, um, yeah so you- he's impressive. So we did positive poker and of course, there's an audio in Kindle. I did all the reading on the audio. So uh, all the books that we've done together, I've done the audio on that, just if anybody cares. Um, and then we followed that up with peak poker performance. 
And so he was on that one too. And then the latest book I did, I actually did with my podcast co-host, Gareth James, and that one's Purposeful Practice for Poker. And so that one's all about how to deliberately practice for poker, because it's quite a bit different than, you know, maybe the way you deliberately practice for, I don't know, many other things, right? Well, poker is a game of complexity. Yes. And by virtue of it being so complex, you must be intentional as it relates to improving your game because you can watch a random video on your favorite training site, poker coaching, run it once, whatever. And, you know, you could just watch 10 hours of videos and like hit a bunch of different spots that aren't doing hardly any work for your overall poker game. Right. Like you have to be intentional about identifying your weaknesses, finding entry spots so that you can study those specific areas and improve there. Um, because I, I also think of poker as like a, a machine, right? It's like a, a car with many different parts that are all interconnected and all working together. And like the thought of improving your poker game is quite frankly, overwhelming. The mm -hmm. thought of actually teaching and coaching and pulling out these elements of this car to, you know, transfer the knowledge to students so that they can work on it, improve it, optimize it, then put it back in the system. Like it's a really difficult thing because so many things are happening all at the same time and they all merit attention. And yeah, so it's very, the trap is to just bounce around from one thing to another and learn a bunch of things, not very well, and make hardly any impact to your overall win rate. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. And I think the other thing is I can watch somebody, but that doesn't mean I actually can implement. And I, you know, may not know when to implement. And to your point, a big thing that we focus on in the book is that you have to have clear goals. What is it that you specifically want to learn? And there are certain aspects of the game, which they're going to give you a huge ROI if you get really good at those. Um, so I'm thinking pre-flop and on the flop, right? Because that's what happens the most. Whereas, you know, some obscure river spot where, you know, somebody four bet jammed on you, right? Like it may be sexy, but that's not going to come up enough that it really makes a meaningful difference. So it's also figuring out where you should put your limited time and energy. So it, the book focuses on that. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's a greatness bomb. And that's the same exact approach that I've used as it relates to creating products. You know, mm -hmm. my first product is pre-flop bootcamp, right? Again, Makes not sense. very sexy. It's not a very <laughs> sexy thing to sell and get people involved in, but it is the most impactful thing that you can do because this is the beginning of the decision tree. Most right. of your decisions, um, just from a frequency standpoint, they happen pre-flop. And when you have a set pre-flop strategy, it frees up bandwidth so that you're able to more focus on your post-flop decisions. And you know, the next thing that my associate coach and I are coming out with is continue continuation betting versus recreational players. Because guess what? Rex play way too many hands. And so you yes. are very frequently isolating and C betting against them. So again, it's hitting these high frequency spots where the majority of your win rate comes from focusing on those first, instead of, like you said, you know, the bet three bet river jam, sexy bluff spot that happens like, you know, once every three or four lifetimes, like you can, you can invest tons of energy into the hand, but it's not going to do very much for you at the end of the day. And at the end of the day, the goal of this game is to, maximize your win rate that's and right. so yeah that that's the stuff that that's that's what i found as well my approach to helping people improve uh, great minds think alike <laughs> there you go if you're going to start somewhere start at the beginning right that seems to make sense right. to me um <laughs> so you wrote your two your your first two books they're published mm -hmm. what changed about your life like did anything unexpected happen did you go deeper in your mm -hmm. poker journey I mean, I think I've never stopped with poker, right? I love it just as much today as I did in 2006. And uh, I think what changes when you come out with, you know, the books and the podcasts and the things is that I've had more of an opportunity to talk to people, get to know people. Uh, and, you know, you're only as good as kind of your network, right? And so when you get opportunities to network with people, and also, I'm going to say, and this is like sort of nerdy and geeky, but I don't care. It gave me the opportunity to meet people that I would have never been, you know, like a Mike Sexton, for example, before he 
he passed, like to spend time around people like that and just hear the stories of poker from 20, 30, 40 years ago. Uh, to me, that's been just the most unique and interesting thing about being in the poker world. Because I know if I was in any other, like I can't go down onto the court and be like, hey, Steph, how's it going? <laughs> right. But I can go up to, you know, fill in the blank of your favorite poker player like one time I was playing in an event this has been a few years ago and uh the guy next to me I just happened to mention to him that I love Fabian Quas and Fabian Fabian Quas what is like Q-U-O-S-S he's a he's Das German yeah he's one of the Germans uh German crusher but he's not playing too much anymore. But this was a few years ago and, and he was, and this guy, and the reason it had come up is because the guy was like, oh, you know, from Germany and whatever. And I was like, oh, let me tell you my favorite player. And he's like, oh no, I room with him like here during the summer. And he was like, let me get, I'll text him. I tell him to come over. Right. And I was like, hell yeah, text him, tell him to come over. <laughs> right. Yeah. Like that's never going to happen in any other realm that I can think of probably. Right. Yeah, poker players are very accessible, more accessible than yeah. you think. And yeah, you're right. It, it's really cool having a conversation. Like, I love um, Matt Savage. Uh, mm -hmm. I've always yeah. just looked up to Matt Savage. He's ran like a bunch of the the big events when I was coming up in the game. I see him on TV. Like, I like Matt yeah. Savage as a tournament director. He's yeah. been on the show twice, and he's on my newsletter. And mm -hmm. uh, here's a little scary thing that people who are on my newsletter may not be aware of but you can see who opens your newsletters right like right. you can see the the email address and like when i send out a newsletter i look to see like the open rate and all that stuff and i see matt savage's email address like almost every day and i'm like yeah matt savage yeah. is reading my emails <laughs> every day like <laughs> it's like a little point of pride um which is just you know it's really cool like having a conversation with phil galfond and jason coon mm -hmm. and you know, talking to some of the all-time crushers and the most brilliant minds in poker. Like, I am a poker player, and these are the guys that I've looked up to that I know, you know, in some situations, poker is such a nuanced and complex game that, like, people who are playing at a level of, like, a Jason Kuhn, um, their greatness is not easily observable to right. uh, just your recreational player, but to somebody like me, seeing somebody perform at that level and do things that are just mind-blowingly amazing and innovative and smart and clever like i value that more than anything else um in the poker world so like i'm always attracted to cash game players too because that's yeah. kind of kind of what i am uh so yeah those guys it, it, it's a great gig like as far as networking <laughs> goes like it's a networking superpower having your own podcast yeah, it doesn't suck. And I'll tell you, a few years ago, when uh, they did the first, you know, big televised high roller, uh, it was at the Aria. I think it was maybe like 2015, 2016. It was CBS News and Poker Central, and they were all in. It, but it was the first time they had done it. And we were in the, I don't know what you want to call it like the back area they had a big setup with the, like all the food and the bar and, and everything like that and uh I was there primarily with Matt Berkey and kind of cheering him on and stuff but Gareth was there too because Gareth had done some ICM work for um, Matt and I had interviewed um Fedor Holes a couple times uh on a podcast I used to do with Elliot Rowe and so Fedor comes in and of course Gareth is, you know, just like, I really want to meet him, you know, because I'm a big fan or whatever. And so I was like, oh, hey, Fedor, you know, here's my friend Gareth. He's like really into ICM, you know, that's his jam. And Fedor looks right at us. He's like, ICM is dead. <laughs> 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 and I was just like, okay, he's definitely thinking on a different level. <laughs> you know what I mean? But uh, it was just really funny. And Gareth was like, oh my God, he said ICM was dead like after he left. <laughs> yeah. This is my thing. I'm big right. into ICM. It's my specialty. ICM I was like, is ah, it's dead. not dead. I was like, it's not dead. You're good. But uh, I'm like, he's right, just, just messing with you. <laughs> yeah, he just crushed a soul right there without right? even taking a breath, um, right? missing a beat. 
Yeah, but, uh, it's so funny. Like, when would I ever have an opportunity? You know, because I did the podcast and I'd interviewed him a couple times, and I could be like, "Oh, hey, how you doing?" You know, it's, it's me from the podcast, right? Yeah. Like, when I am mean, I ever going to get that in any other field or realm? Sure. You mentioned Berkey. Like me and Berkey mm-hmm. chat on Twitter. He's very accessible mm-hmm. in DMs. He's very generous with his time and his energy. He's just a great dude. And yeah. I just a lot of poker players. You know, you you mentioned it earlier about this image poker has as far as being like gambly and back rooms and smoke and lying and cheating and stealing and all of the negative connotations that, you know, playing poker can be associated with. And like the reality is so farther, it couldn't be much more farther from the truth because the truth is like guys are brilliant in this Mm -hmm. game that are successful. They're brilliant. They're smart. They're made of steel. Um, They're just amazing, inspiring human beings. And I just, yeah, you can tell I'm 16 years into my own poker journey and I still love having these conversations with these human beings, you know, as much as I would have 15 years ago. Only now you can ask better questions. (laughs) Yes. Now I can ask much better questions. That's how uh, I am. Like, like I, the things I would think to ask, you know, back then were, you know, not good. Whereas now, if I have the opportunity to commune with somebody who's just one of these great thinkers, hopefully I could come up with, you know, a better question that's going to lead me to have some realizations, right, that I wouldn't have gotten when I, you know, when you just get started, you don't know what you don't know. Yeah, exactly. Like, I've I've thought about this a lot in that I'm, I had another podcast where I interviewed high achievers, and I put in like 40 reps or so of interviewing folks. And I've been, you know, poker has been my sole source of income for 16 years. It's like my whole life, my livelihood. And so when I started the podcast, I kind of realized I have this like interesting mix of having some experience with having decent conversations and, you know, facilitating good answers that are beneficial to the audience. And I can also discuss poker at a high level too, which kind of separates me from, you know, some of the other, poker media that exists out there in the wild. Yeah, for sure. I totally see that and get that. Yeah, before boot camp, I had been playing for maybe 15 years, somewhat seriously, always trying to get better, jumping from learning program to different learning programs and training site to training site. Kind of feeling a little bit lost, not really knowing how to go about getting better. And pre flop boot camp just felt like a great starting point, a way for me to to move from being a losing player to to possibly a winning player. It felt like the right first step. Once you jumped in boot camp, what was your experience like? Well, first off, I realized that I'd been making a lot of mistakes prior to boot camp, kind of learning what Rangers should look like and what hands should be played and what situations. You know, it was it was exciting because I I could see what other people had been doing to me, what kind of what I had been missing in my game. And then from there, just the whole camaraderie of everybody that's um, signed up, working together, trying to achieve that goal. You know, that that was fun. That's uh, pushing each other and really helping uh, one another, kind of feeling like you're a part of a team. It was uh, it was a great experience. I, I enjoyed the process and I learned a lot. What was your experience like playing cards post boot camp? It's a totally different experience. You know, it put me in a position to be successful as opposed to always being behind the eight ball and, and playing catch up. Um, I really feel like it's it's the foundation of, of a solid poker game. And uh, since boot camp, I've been able to, to turn a profit and keep building on what I learned there. You know, being able to go back into the group and uh, re- really work together even after boot camp was over, it's it's been awesome. What's your sample size of winning post boot camp? I think I have 70,000 hands played by now. You know, I'm a father and I have a job, so I'm not a, a professional player by any means. That's my sample size. Preflop Bootcamp is the flagship Chasing Poker Greatness training program. If you'd like to dramatically upgrade your preflop game, a new bootcamp launches on the last Saturday of every single month. The price is $199 and your link to join is chasingpokergreatness.com slash bootcamp. One more time, that's chasingpokergreatness.com slash bootcamp, all one word, or you can click through in the description box of this episode. So 
when we left off in your journey, you had yes. gotten a couple of books published. Uh, yes. What, you know, anything notable after that, like any, any surprising aspects to your poker journey? When did the podcast come about? You mentioned you did an, an earlier podcast with Elliot mm-hmm. Rowe. Tell me about those stories. I mean, you know, one day Elliot uh, just asked me, he's like, hey, you want to do a podcast? I was like, sure. <laughs> Seems like a great idea. <laughs> and so we were, uh, you know, interviewing people. I can't remember how many episodes we did, but it was a good number, you know, like 90 episodes, 100, something like that. It was a decent number uh, that we did. And then I had an idea that I wanted to go in a different direction because what we were doing there is we would just be asking them, you know, questions, right? Which was great. I mean, don't get me wrong. Uh, we had like phenomenal Daniel DeVores interviewed him, uh, Chris Moneymaker, who's like a super interesting, nice guy. I mean, you name it. We, you know, Fedor a couple times. We had big, good names, right? But I wanted to make a shift because I wanted to answer questions that I get, which are more on the psychology side of it, right? Instead of, you know, just asking questions. And so Gareth, my, my ICM pal, <laughs> uh, you know, he's a qualified teacher in England. So he, before he was making his full-time living playing poker, you know, he was teaching uh, music. So he liked that idea. And he was like, you know, we should, we should do that where I answer a question and he does mostly tournament poker. So he would answer that. And, you know, I'll chime in when I've got thoughts and, uh, and then I would answer, you know, a psychology mental game type question. And of course he could chime in on that too. And so between the two of us, I think that's like, a, you know, a decent format. So we've been doing that. That's poker on the mind. And uh, I think we have like, we just recorded, I think it was episode 81. So yeah, we've been crack a lacking on that. Yeah, got a couple hundred podcast episodes out there almost in the wild. It's crazy. Yeah, do you still (laughs) communicate with Elliot? Oh yeah, from time to time. Yeah, Yeah. he's another good dude who he's been on the show and in in my opinion has always been pretty accessible. I know his his mental game Mm -hmm. coaching rates have kind of uh, gone through the roof, but in my mind, always accessible, always generous with his time, providing feedback. And I have no doubt that like, if I invited him to come on the show, he would, he'd be down, down for coming on again. I'm sure he would. Oh yeah, for sure. Just, Uh, yeah. That's the nice thing about poker. I think the world is in general, very collegial, which is, you know, not something that every industry can say, right? Sure. We like, we like helping people out. Uh, I don't know why. Can we all just get along? Yeah. We're just <laughs> wired to help people, I, I, which is kind of ironic considering what we have chosen our lives to do. And that is beat people <laughs> up at the, at the poker table. Oh, I'm going to beat you up at the poker table if I get a chance, but I'm going to make it fun too, if I get a chance. So uh, yeah, I, I love to have fun and you meet the most interesting people at the poker table and you know, just to hear people's stories and a lot of people in poker, you know, they're, they're not doing poker as a living, they're doing it as a hobby. And so you get to hear it from that vantage point, but also a lot of them have really interesting careers outside of, of poker. So you get to meet interesting people. And I'd say, you know, 99% of the time when I'm at a poker table, it's fun and games and I'm enjoying myself. And then, you know, there's 1% of the time where maybe there's somebody at the table who's making it not that pleasant, but it doesn't come up that often. Yeah. I mean, if somebody can plunk down a few thousand bucks for the, a buy-in to a poker tournament, typically they they're doing okay in some aspect yeah. of life. If they're a losing tournament player, right. They have, they're successful enough that busting out of this thing doesn't really affect them one way or the other, which naturally means that, you know, you've, play against a lot of the more successful people in the world and they have interesting stories and they have interesting insights and wisdom that they've gained on their journey that you know is beneficial if you're able to have a relationship with these people and you know just be you know just be a cool person i think that's that's the the deal if you're playing poker professionally against lesser players just be cool to the people that you interact with and ask good questions and be stay curious The one thing that I enjoy too, and this is more of, you know, poker from a woman's point of view is a lot of times when I walk up to the table, like I can see the guys, you know, 
they're like, oh yeah, you know, we got one we're going to take care of now. And uh, I, I do enjoy that when I spot it because I know they're ripe for the picking that I can easily mess with them. And so. Yeah. Little, let, let, little do they know if they're like <laughs> in their mid forties um, walking up to the table that the young 20, 25 year old kids are like thinking the same exact thing when they take their seat at the table. Yeah. But it's funny. I mean, I think it's not just a female thing, but also like the younger guys, sometimes it's the same thing. They're just like, I don't know. They think, Oh, I don't know. They stereotype play or yeah. Yeah. Which is a good, it is a good thing to do in general because stereotypes are stereotypes for a reason, right? They tend to be true. You know, like I can look at a, you know, old man coffee and you know, the where it becomes a problem is if the person shows me something, I need to revise my stereotype. And most people have a hard time with that. I can tell you one time I was playing and Barbara Enright, she got seated to my right. And uh, do you know who Barbara Enright is? I do. Okay. A lot people may not know who she is, but she's been around, you know, for a long, long time. She's made the final table of a the main event of the World Series. I mean, she is a legend. But She's an older lady now. And um, she came and she got seated and all the guys on my table as she's, you know, getting everything situated, she had a little beret on and she had, you know, her hair in a braid. And she just looks like this sweet older lady, right? And they're all like running their mouths. And uh, somebody said something. I, I don't know. I think I might've said to her, like your stack is dirty or something like that. And one of the guys was like, she's helping her say that I was like, helping like oh it's not fair like she's helping her or whatever and I was like she she don't need my help but it was very apparent that like they had no idea who she was and they thought she was this little old lady and they were just and I was like "Mm -hmm, this is gonna be fun I'm gonna sit back and I'm gonna watch her beat the hell out of you guys and this is gonna be good fun (laughs) and and she did and they never did figure it out and she left and I was like "Ah," you know (laughs) you got your asses handed to you by Barbara and right ah and I had another um, thing like that. It was, well, obviously it wasn't this last year because we didn't have World Series. Um, maybe it was last, you know, the previous World Series. I was playing the team event. And this is like a weird thing. You know how big the events are at the World Series, right? They're like yep. many thousands of people. So I had played the team event the year before. And my day one, table one, I had this father-son team on there. Well, this next one, the one I'm about to tell you the story at, that same father-son team was on my day one table one again, which is really weird, but that's not the important thing. Um, Barry Schulman was on our table who uh, owns card player, right? And has been around poker forever and a day. So him and um, his wife and their daughter, they were, they were the team. But anyway, these guys on my table were just like, who's this old man? He don't know shit, Right. And every time a question would come up about some sort of tournament rule, Barry would say something and these other guys at the table would just be arguing with him, which is really stupid because Barry was like on the committee of people who wrote the TDA rules, right? (laughs) Yeah. And the father-son team, so the son, he was on my direct left and he had some interactions with Barry. And uh, of course, I'm not saying anything. I'm just watching and enjoying the show and eating my, you know, invisible popcorn, as it were. <laughs> but anyway, Barry got up to like go do something. And uh I say to the guy, because you know, I'd had him on my table the year before, and you know, so we've been friendly. And I was like, <laughs> I go, you don't know who that is, do you? And he's like, No, like who is it? Should I? <laughs> and I was like, uh, oh, that's Barry Schulman. And he again, he was still kind of like, who? And like, uh, he owns card player. And then He's like, why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you tell me? I was like, because I was enjoying watching you make an ass out of yourself. (laughs) And all the other guys on the table too. I was like, dude, just because he looks like he's in a certain demographic to you doesn't mean that he hasn't been around or doesn't know what's going on. And what's funny about it is that there's contradictory signals here, right? Like there's this stereotyping the first impression and then there's also he seems to have a good foundational knowledge of the (laughs) rules like how do I reconcile these two things in my mind and the reality is like people do judge a cover by its book Mm -hmm. very 
greatly. And once that impression is made, it's really difficult for people to question whether or not that impression was accurate or not accurate. And you have to, you know, if you stereotype, then stereotype, I think, like you said, there's benefit in that. However, when you get contradictory data that says maybe my stereotype was not accurate, you should <laughs> probably rethink um, your first impression, right? But you know, to your point on this, what I think the guys at the table, even though Barry was coming with the knowledge bombs, they were like, yeah, he doesn't know what he's talking about. You know, and they even called the floor a couple times. And of course, the floor was just like, uh, yeah, you know, with whatever Bearhead said. And they still, you know, there's a very strong desire to to keep everything congruent. So you don't want to admit like, oh, I made a mistake. This guy actually knows something, you know. Yeah, it's, it's a not cognitive just that, dissonance, right? Yeah. And it's not just that Barry Schulman knows the rules. Barry Schulman's a pretty darn good poker player, <laughs> you know, he's been around a while, he knows. And, uh, you know, it's just, I see that kind of stuff all the time. Yeah, I mean, even how somebody handles their chips is a pretty mm -hmm. good indicator as to like their familiarity around mm -hmm. a poker table, right? I've never had the luxury of being stereotyped as anything other than what I am just because I've always been a young person. Well, I'm getting older now as time <laughs> goes on. Eventually, I've lost all my hair, apparently, somewhere in the middle of the pandemic. But <laughs> typically, I'm one of the younger players at the table. And like, you know, the stereotype there is young kid shows up and buys right. in for five or 10K, like probably knows what he's doing at a poker table. But it's, it's very easy. And I, I've noticed it as well. People just stereotyping folks. And then the cognitive dissonance sets in once they've done it and they can't reconcile, they can't make sense of the reality of the situation, which is, uh, you know, there's a lot to be said for, you know, setting an image that is contrary to how you're actually performing at the poker table. And that first impression, it, it does work. It does work. Absolutely. But yeah, I've, I've had some good fun at the tables in my day. <laughs> Let, let's, uh, what does your process look like for improving your approach to helping folks improve their mindsets, your coaching process? How, how do you work on that, hone that, add new ideas, try new stuff out? Yeah, well, I'm really interested always in what the person thinks their issue is, um, but I'm a fan of a couple of different ideologies within psychology. So I like solution oriented brief therapy. So I've had a lot of training in that. I'm really into individual psychology, which is the psychology of Alfred Adler. So I'm into that, uh, like reality therapy, which is William Glasser, uh, positive psychology. Martin Seligman is kind of the biggest name associated with that, but there's many, many other names. Um, but I think the, the thread that runs amongst them all is that I believe that people want to do better. So some areas of psychology, you know, focus much more on the negative, right? So I'm not into that, but I'm not into toxic, toxic positivity. So I just want to put that out there. Toxic positivity is this idea that you're just like, uh, you know, talking to yourself all the time and saying, I'm the greatest and I'm the best. And, you know, like keep um, optimism at all times. You know, I'm not into that because that's just, delusional it's, it's not right but um so i like to help people see where they're going to get the most bang for their buck and how can i help them achieve those goals so it could be habits okay um a lot of things i'm sure you, you know this will sound familiar to you but there are a lot of habits you can optimize to improve performance so i do a lot with that uh i do what a are lot some examples of habits let's I mean, well, we got our fundamentals, right? Are always going to be our fundamentals, eat, move, sleep, right? Uh, so exercise, diet, you know, sleep. Those are good habits. Um, study, you know, you could put study on autopilot. Anything that you can habitize is going to be good for you because it's going to decrease the amount of willpower that it takes because by definition, when something becomes a habit, it's on autopilot. I don't have to think about it. I don't have to stress about it, right? So anything I can do around that, it depends on the person as to what they're going to get the most, you know, benefit from. 
but I'm a big fan of figuring out where you want to go. And then let's look for the most expedient route to get you there. So how do you do that? How do you discern what's going to be the, you know, what's going to give the most bang for one of your clients bucks? Like how, what does that exploration process look like? Well, it depends, right? Because some of the people that I work with are already functioning at a very, very high level, right? And so they only need like the minor tweaks. And then some other people are just, uh, you know, maybe they suffer from procrastination, right? So there's going to be a very specific uh, set of questions and strategies that I advise for them to take to improve upon their procrastination, right? Uh, If it's emotional regulation, which that's a big one for a lot of poker players. Uh, that's going to be a different set of concerns. So it just depends on you know what they're bringing to the table as to what I think the answer is. Sure. There and are a it, lot of answers potentially, as you well know, right? Oh, there's a lot of answers and there's <laughs> even more questions. Yes. Uh, yes. A lot of questions, a lot of answers. Um, when it comes to somebody like Fedor Holtz, like he hit you up to talk about mindset and ask you questions. How do you approach somebody that's already operating on like a top-notch world-class level that's like, hmm, this is a uh, you know, tough nut to crack as far as uh, adding some upgrades or finding the potential to add upgrades? I mean, I think everybody can find upgrades, but I think when you're talking about people who are at the top like that, they usually have a lot of self-awareness And so they're usually going to say, what do I need to do about X? And they already have in mind, you know, what that X is. Um, Self-awareness, you know, just as an aside, if I had to say, what's one thing you need to have dialed in to, you know, succeed really in anything, I would have to, self-awareness would definitely be up there. It's probably the top choice because, so many people have problems because they lack awareness. They're not aware of what the problem is. Sometimes, you know, if you're doing therapeutic work, a lot of it is just holding up a mirror, you know, and reflecting back to someone. You know, you say you want this and yet you're doing that. You know, what's that about? Uh, what is it that you really want? A lot of people cannot answer that for you. If I say, what do you want to get out of, you know, playing poker? Or, you know, fill in the blank. It could be anything. But what do you want? How many people do you reckon have a good answer to that? Not as many as <laughs> I would think. Not as many right. as I would like, right? It's a logistical issue. There's no logistical map. There's no plan for like right. what you want. I've done a number of aspirant episodes on this show, which are basically – just consultations, mindset consultations, trying to create a logistical plan for folks who are entering the poker world. And some of them have been released and some not. But very specifically, I remember pressing one guy on, why are you playing poker? Why do you mm-hmm. want to move up from 1-3 to 2-5? What does it mean to you? What do you stand to gain? Like, right. Is it worth investing tons of money financially and energy and your life force to make that jump? Just to be clear that like if you're going to pursue this, that you have a solid reason for doing it other than it feels like a thing that I might want to do one day, right? right? Um, See, so that's yeah. the self-awareness that I'm talking about, right? Like if you don't have the self-awareness, how can we get to the next steps? Yeah. So if you, you don't know. have visibility of the problem, how do you solve it? I mean, I can tell you right now, and I can make this sound very easy, but the steps you can go through would be, What do you want? And then once I've dialed that in, what are you doing to get what you want? A lot of people are surprisingly fuzzy on that. (laughs) Is what you're doing to get what you want working? Well, usually if we've gotten that far, we know the answer to that. It's no. Okay. Then we have to make a plan to help you get what you want. Then you go and you execute that plan. And then we're going to see, you know, how did it work? Where does it need, you know, some tweaking and whatnot, right? And then we're just going to go back to the top. If we have problems, well, what do you want? What are we trying to achieve? What is the objective? You know, you got to get really clear on that. Then what are you doing to get what you want? Is it working? The answer is always no when people are working with a coach of any type, right? Something is not working or we wouldn't be here. As So this sounds so 
glaringly obvious for anybody listening to this conversation that like these are the logical rational steps to take <laughs> in order to solve these problems so what is the hang up what is the thing that stops people from even gaining awareness or even asking the right questions or even realizing that there is a problem that they ought to start investing energy into solving I mean, I think it's multi-pronged and it, you know, could depend on the person too, right? Because everybody brings their own experiences, their own background, right? Which could, you know, be driving their particular hangups. Okay. For some people, it's, they're overwhelmed. There's too many choices, right? Right now in our society, we have an embarrassment of riches. We have too many choices. Well, there's plenty of research that's been done that shows that the more choices you have, the more difficult it becomes to make a choice, right? Because you've got the FOMO, the fear of missing out, or don't want to make a wrong decision, blah, blah, blah. Okay. You can also have fears. So it could be fear of failure, could be fear of success, could be perfectionism, right? We could have that. Uh, we could have something that impedes us from, you know, fully focusing, fully investing, whether that's ADHD, depression, anxiety. So those could be hangups. Uh, we, you know, maybe even substance abuse. I, I didn't really mention that because I don't like doing work around substance abuse. So I usually just pretend that just doesn't even exist. <laughs> it's not even a thing. It, it's just that, yeah. I mean, I take my hat off to people who can do work in that area. It's just not something that I enjoy. Um, although it's important. It's, you know, if people do have substance abuse issues that are getting in the way, definitely you should find a qualified provider. Yes. It's hard because... I, in my, in my own mindset work that I do with my poker players, my students, I often realize that a lot of the things, a lot of the decisions that they make at the poker table are primarily emotionally driven. And there's some sort of emotion that's driving the choice behind, you know, what sizing they choose on the river or whether they ought to be bluffing in the spot or whatever. And with some guys, they don't even realize that they're experiencing an emotion that's behind this decision that is the thing that kind of helps and not helps it's it hinders them in the way that like they have betting patterns right they start betting full right. pot when they have a value hand they start uh betting 50 percent pot when they're bluffing it's like greed and risk aversion these emotions that kind of manifest while you're playing cards people don't even realize that they're experiencing emotions much less even being driven by them and choosing each option based on some emotional response. And like with recreational players and inexperienced players, this is like the number one thing that causes them to have betting patterns and allows the pros to read them very, very well. It's like, you know, you're, you're being driven by your emotions. You don't realize it. And it's causing you to do some really bad things that make you very obvious to read. And it's really interesting that you bring that up because I think, as a society with a lot of the socialization, particularly with men, they don't have a lot of training with emotions, right? Basically, as you're growing up, it's like, don't cry, you know, don't be a baby. <laughs> and There's so you shame. basically, yeah, yeah. And you learn that, okay, there are only a couple of acceptable emotions, even though there's like hundreds of emotions, right? So you don't know how to express, how to interact, how to think about them. You don't have that context for it for a lot of people. And, you know, mostly men, but some women too, right, may just lack this ability. So, you know, my business, we call that emotional intelligence. And if you're going to be a success in anything, you have to be high in emotional intelligence. It's probably in many fields, even more important than what we think of as just typical intelligence, right? So there's that. Then there's the aspect of if I have the emotion and I recognize that I have the emotion, so that's part of the battle. Well, then how do I interact with the emotion, you know, react to it, interact with it and all that. And we have a lot of crazy ideas about that. And I use the word crazy very colloquially here. But, uh, you know, we think, oh, I've got to be positive all the time. That's back to that toxic positivity, not realizing that that's not possible, nor is it even preferable. So we don't know how to deal with the emotions. and So we're not aware. And if we get some awareness, then we still don't know what to do. Yeah. And 
if for high performers, high performers always fall into the salt, the same trap in my coaching sessions. They want to finagle and find a way to go around the emotion to yeah. make it a non factor right? It's like, yep. how do I navigate around this? Like, you know, if I'm feeling overwhelmed when I feel like I make a bad decision, if I just play zoom poker where I don't have time to think and deal with my emotions, then I, it just won't be an issue anymore. Right? Like always trying to like game the system to the best of their ability. And like the reality is that, you know, feel your emotions. Emotions are meant to be felt. You don't, push them down. You don't not experience them. You don't say that you're happy when you're not happy. You don't, um, you know, you, you just experience them and then they're transient. So it's temporary. They go on and it's all about recovery, right? Like my guys, oh, yeah, absolutely. hundred percent of everything that we talk about at mindset related is how do we increase your recovery? If you get beat down at the poker table and the only way for you to recover and play another session is to have a sleep cycle, go to sleep at night, wake up fresh as a daisy. How do we reduce that recovery so that you can recover much faster, put in another session to end your day so that, you know, you get in more volume so that you make more money that day so that you make more money that week, that month, and then that year. And and it all carries over. And really the folks who are the mentally strongest that I've encountered just have an amazing ability to recover regardless of, you know, what's in their path. They can experience it. They have downswings. They make bad decisions, right, that that they can ruminate on that cause them mental stress, but they're just able to recover much faster than the folks, um, you know, who, who are not playing at a, or operating at a high, as high a level as they are. The other thing I would piggyback on that, uh, I agree with everything you just said, is the idea that emotions are not facts. It's not the truth. Like just because you feel a certain way, it's not an order that you must, you know, behave in a certain way. Like I feel angry, therefore I must, you know, throw over this poker table, right? I don't, I, it's not an order. It's not the law. Like I can feel anger and yet still choose, you know, to make the best choice, the right choice. But sometimes we act as though we don't have that choice. We go, well, he made me do it. Because, you know, whatever, he made me matter, you know, whatever, right? Mm -hmm. He made me do it. No, I I made a choice, which if I go back through my, you know, list of questions, what did I want? And did that choice help me get what I want? I mean, the answer is probably no, or we wouldn't be talking about it. Right. (laughs) Right? I want to touch back on something that you mentioned earlier, because a story crossed my mind when you were talking about men having a lower emotional intelligence because it gets, we get disincentivized Mm -hmm. as children. We cry Mm -hmm. and the parents say, stop crying. Mm -hmm. Stop being a baby. Stop Mm -hmm. it. Hold it in. Right. Like, which is clearly devastatingly painful for emotional development and not good in general for these kids. But I was talking to a friend of mine who's one of the kindest, wisest humans that I know and always listens um, very closely, provides good feedback. He's understanding, accepting of people who have different beliefs than him. And we were having a conversation one day and we were talking about emotions. And he mentioned that like sometimes on TV, he'll be watching a show and, you know, he'll tear up a little bit. And he's Mm -hmm. probably 50 with a couple of grown kids and and he's married. And he's like, you know, I got to leave. I leave the room um, when I get teared up. And I'm like, why? Like, well, mm-hmm. why, why are you leaving the room? It, it, because he feels shame about yeah. experiencing that emotion. And that to me is just so, so, so sad. So any listener out there, don't hurt your kids when they cry or when they have emotions. Don't disincentivize those because mm-hmm. they're meant to be felt. And that can just do so much long-term damage in their life that like, yeah, ser- serve your kids very well and let, let them express their emotions. Um that's all I got. That's a really good story because it really exemplifies the fact that your friend obviously has a very high level of emotional intelligence from everything you said. He's a great listener. He gives good feedback and all this. And yet he, even though he's evolved at a much higher level than probably many people we know, he still has that kernel of shame that he's like, oh, I can't, I can't show this 
you know, whether he thinks it's weakness or vulnerability or, or whatever it is, he thinks, oh, I can't show this, you know, to my kids or my wife or friends or whoever, right? Yeah. And I'm not going to lie to you. Like whenever I watched the, my octopus teacher documentary earlier this year, like I started having a breakdown. I was mm-hmm. like starting to cry. And like, I just felt it wash over me, the sadness. And my instinct was to, you know, try to cover my face, try to go use the bathroom so yeah. that, you know, my wife doesn't see me just bawling um, while I'm watching this documentary. And, you know, this is my instinct because that's, this is what was trained into me as a young child. And yeah, yeah, it, it, it's sad. It, it's sad, but that's the reality. But we don't have to stay with that. Like when we recognize that, hey, you know, I'm doing this. So you've recognized it. And now that you've recognized it and you have that self-awareness, then you can make a choice, you know, with what you want to do with that information. And just as a second aside, emotions are data. So people who are like, oh, I just want to get by them as quickly as possible. You know, like we, you had talked about, well, you're leaving a lot of data on the, on the table or on the floor. I don't know <laughs> the right analogy here, but you're leaving that data behind by just saying, oh, I want to get around it instead of saying, hmm, what are my emotions trying to tell me about this situation? That hmm. is a greatness bomb. That is, that is great because there are no poker players in the world that hate data. We love data. I know, right? <laughs> we do not want to pass up data. And so uh, framing it that way from a perspective of you know, there's data here that ought to be analyzed and can be useful. Mm -hmm. So don't just ignore it and leave it there. That's not the solution. I think that's very appealing to high performers and poker players that want to operate at a higher level. Oh, yeah, for sure. Don't leave your data behind. Yeah, don't leave your data behind. (laughs) Um, What's the most high impact action you think poker players can take to improve their mindset? Wow. I mean, there's, there's a lot of things that I can think of that have a lot of, um, research efficacy behind them so there's a lot of good research behind meditation so having a meditation habit a more important would be consistent habit than you know the length so if you meditate every day for five minutes and you never miss that's way more effective than you know meditating for an hour a day but you only do it like once a month right so meditation has a lot of good data behind it journaling has a lot of good data behind it tracking Uh, I'd say anything that you want to get better at, you want to track because, you know, if you want to improve something, you need to measure it. There's like a saying about that. What Peter Drucker measured, you know, that's what you measure. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you know, Peter. I know Um, Peter. We're good friends. We're down like four flat tires. (laughs) But yeah. So um, journaling would have and, and tracking, you know, I kind of put those two together, right? Because I, I think a lot of people think when you're journaling, you're just writing to your diary, I feel, you know, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and that would be fine. You could write down, you know, how you're feeling, but, but it could also be a means of tracking, you know, things that you want to track and improve and, and measure. Um, so I, I try and get all of my people on a meditation habit. And like I said, it doesn't have to be long. You don't have to hike to the Himalayas or anything like that. But, you know, five minutes a day, every day. If five minutes seems too onerous, do one minute. Like, I really don't care. I love that you're addressing these problems without even hearing the problem. Like, you already know it's like meditation. People are like, ugh, I don't want to do it. I'm like, damn, I don't want to. I got to sit there for five minutes. Just do one minute then. That's fine. (laughs) Do any amount you want. It doesn't matter. I think that if you want to build things like willpower and resistance and, you know, emotional flexibility, all those things, showing yourself that you have the ability to make a habit, you know, a commitment to yourself and keep that, that's just going to benefit you in so many ways. So yeah, I don't need to know the problem to give you some solutions. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I know yeah. the problem. It's just a bonus. <laughs> Meditation, one of the number one things that we talk about in, in my elite program and also journaling is another thing that we we also address. And for the record, they send videos, two to three minute videos explaining the, their blocks. If they hit their blocks, their volume on the day, and then any 
mental feedback loops. So things that are kind of sticking in their mind that we can kind of tackle during our optimization sessions uh, and progression, right? People don't measure their progression typically as it relates to poker. It's like we measure our progression based on our results, which can be, you know, not accurate at all. And if you do make a video journal of like discussing poker and what you're learning, what you're studying, you can revisit this in six months and see like, oh, I've grown so much in the last six months, even though like maybe the results do not give you that feedback. You can still say like, I have made tons of gains. I'm proud of where I'm going. I feel like I'm going in the right direction. But like, if you never, if you never track your progression, you, you just never know you're, you have no anchor. Yeah, I totally agree with that. It's like you're in the wilderness, <laughs> blind, <laughs> no no compass, no map, no nothing. You you don't know where you've been. You don't know where you're going. <laughs> yeah, you're, just, you're, you, you got nothing. Everything is Everything feels more risky. You don't know your level of skill, so you don't have a basis to say, like, I am a high-level player because this is where I was, this is where I'm at. You, you know, that gives you resilience. If you're just mm-hmm. like your identity is based on how you did at poker that day. Well, yeah, of course you're going to be like a a ship at sea in the middle of a storm, just blown, you know, this way and that, like you need, you need an anchor of knowledge that creates some resilience in your poker sessions in your poker game. And yeah, it's just, it's in any endeavor, but poker is especially important. And the thing you brought out about that with people are so results oriented in poker particularly newer players or less skilled players. You know, we talk about that all the time. I have a Facebook group, um, the Poker Mindset Mastery Lab. It's a private group, which people can, you know, request access to if they would like. But uh, one thing that comes up all the time is people are like, well, um, Mike Matisau's won $6 million. You know, I think he knows something. (laughs) And I'm just picking on Mike Matisau because he was specifically mentioned in a very recent post in there. But it's like, well, how much he has in earnings has nothing to do with, because we're missing an important part of the equation, which is how much money did he spend to get those earnings, you know? Sure. What's his ROI? Right. So like we can look at Hendon Mob and we can look at Antonio Sfondiari and, you know, because he won the one drop, right? It was many, many millions of dollars, and it looks like, okay, he's a supreme poker player on earth if we just look at that number, but how much of that money went into his pocket, and how much of an ROI does he really have? I don't know what it is because I'm not close personal friends with him, and he hasn't shared this data with me. (laughs) Right. Probably because you would just tell the podcast audience exactly you know, what it I is. I probably would, but uh, <laughs> but right, we just can fall in that trap of looking at well, you know, how much money have I won, and even that's not telling you the full story. So I would just caution people not to get caught up in that results-oriented thinking as a way of measuring your poker progress because it's just not going to work very well for you. And the smartest poker player human that I've ever met naturally talented just makes me jealous thinking about his ability to play cards at a world-class elite level said if the top 40 players in the world played a tournament against each other one day a week every day or every week for the rest of their lives at the end of their lives they would not know who the best player was out of those 40 players. That's how big a part variance plays yeah. in, in results. So don't take tons of stock into the results that you see. They're not the full picture. It's very misleading. Ideally, I think that anybody that's approaching it that way is looking for an excuse for not performing at the highest level they're capable of. They're trying to find an out that allows them, you know, gives them some leeway to procrastinate and slack and not do a good job. Just do the work, right? There's resistance. Just do the work, show up, do the best you can. Poker is hard enough when you're doing everything the absolute correct way without having, you know, the Matasawian issues to go (laughs) along with your career. I love that Matasawian. I'm going to have to use that. (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah, I used to teach a, a course. I used to be a tenured college professor and I taught a course called the psychology of poker. And one of the things that I would have the students do, so it was an upper division psychology course, they would have to psychoanalyze a poker player. And of course, you know, you need to, it has to be somebody you can get information on. But one of the ones that I would often encourage and got a lot of papers on was Mike Matisau, because, you know, he wrote uh, Check Raising the Devil, and it's a lot about his personal story and things. And so, you know, they had to psychoanalyze, come up with, you know, how they would diagnose the person and then what treatment plan would they advise for a person with, you know, this particular disorder. So yeah, I've had, I've had some fun teaching around Matasauian issues. <laughs> <laughs> he's out on the, he's being dissected by all of your students um, <laughs> in the class for Matasau. Hey, if he would have had access to that, that would have been a lot of free therapy for him, though. <laughs> yeah, you, you could have offered. Here's 100 papers on diagnosing you and <laughs> and <laughs> offering you all of this help. Aren't you grateful right? for this work that we did? <laughs> I mean, you got to make learning fun, right? And so you do. I you think do. that's that's a pretty fun assignment, right? Oh, that is a great assignment. Obviously, they're I, not I licensed it. professionals. They're still learning. So, you know, take out for what it's worth. But yeah. Sure. So I'm going to segue here to some lightning round questions before mm -hmm. we, you know, before we reach the three hour mark in this conversation. I, I'm loving it, <laughs> by the way. And these lightning <laughs> round questions are typically, uh, you know, they're lightning name and they're lightning round in name only. Um, oh, okay. Okay. If you could gift all poker players one book to read, doesn't have to be specifically a poker book, what would it be and why? Ooh, ooh you are putting it to me today because I like a lot of books. But uh, I hope I'm getting the title right. But Cal Newport wrote a book. You'll have to check the title, but it's something like So Good They Can't Ignore You. That's a great book. Uh, Cal Newport's a computer science professor, and he's written several books. But the premise of that book is that you want to just become so good that you cannot be ignored. And so I think, yeah, that's a no-brainer. Yeah, as my friends, uh, who's an Olympic gold medalist, his dad told him, son, there's always a niche for the best. So yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yep. Be the best. If you're, if you're the best in your field, there's a, you always have a place in the world. If you could wave a magic wand, change one thing about poker, what would it be? I bring online poker back for all of us, just like the heyday, the old days. So I'm going to roll back time and I'm bringing back online poker. <laughs> Earlier on, shockingly, I had eliminated that answer from possibilities oh. because it was like all the answers were like the same one, but then <laughs> it, it's kind of gone away. So I'm glad you're bringing it back. We're going to allow it. I okay. Checked, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Checked with the judges. They're going to okay. allow it. Perfect. Um, <laughs> online poker back. Yes. If you could erect a billboard, every poker player has got to drive past on the way to the casino. What does it say? Mm. Boy, these are tough questions. Um, what am I going to say? You're on your way to the casino. I'm going to say whenever you notice that your emotional temperature is starting to rise, you're going to take a deep breath. You're going to go in through the nose for a count of seven. Hold it's a for long two, billboard. You're going to kill some people on six. the way to the casino. <laughs> Come on now. <laughs> They're going to run into the billboard trying to read Okay, it. maybe I'll shut it. I'll, I'll shorten it to just breathe. How just that? breathe. Yeah, that's because you and I both know that if you start getting agitated, you really need to take a couple deep breaths to kind of, you know, reset, reset your mind. Right. So just breathe. Yeah. Deep breaths. Don't hyperventilate. Don't let your breaths get shallow. Yep. Deep breaths. Again, kind deep, of goes back to awareness. Breath. Having an awareness. And can I have two? Can I have two billboards? Sure. Why not? Okay. My next mil billboard is going to say, "Focus on the fundamentals." There you go. Focus on the fundamentals and just breathe. There you go. What do you? What's something you you feel folks who are chasing their poker dreams don't spend enough time thinking about? Hmm. 
probably don't spend enough time thinking about why they want it. And so what would be the underlying purpose of this? Instead, it's just like, oh, I want it because I want it. And that's not going to be a very powerful motivator if you don't have, you know, some sort of underlying why or purpose behind that. Yes. Find the emotional why behind your endeavor so that you can pick yourself up off the ground when poker inevitably smacks you to the turf and makes you eat dirt. <laughs> right. What's something, right. what's something you feel people chasing their poker dreams spend too much time thinking about? They probably spend too much time worrying about results, you know, being in that results oriented space when what you really need to be focusing on is what am I going to do in order to have constant improvement and the results will come, you know, eventually I can't guarantee when, right. But the more time you're focused on, I guess, you know, it's not fair, what I don't have and the results and all that, the less time you have to put towards actually improving yourself. Yeah. Improving yourself and your poker ability, your mental game, that is the process. The -hmm. results are the side effect of showing up and following that process day in and day out. What's your current, what's your current big role, uh, big, big goal as related to poker? Let me just ask that again. I'll have my producer wipe my horrible um, attempt at speaking a sentence. What is your current big goal as related to poker? My current big goal as related to poker actually has to do more with the work that I do on the psychology side because I want to make the psychology of poker far more accessible to uh, more players. I want more players to become aware of that and embrace it, use it so that, you know, more people can have success in the game. So now I've got a little fledgling YouTube channel going, but I'm going to be putting a lot more effort into that. I'm going to be putting a lot more effort into my podcast and and things of that nature, just so that more players can hopefully come to understand, hey, you really need to put the mindset, you know, first and foremost. As these projects get going, please give me the information and I will share them with my people because it's very important. And in a lot mm-hmm. of cases, it, you know, it can be prohibitive to get help from a mindset department if you know there, there's a lot of cost involved there, yes. right? Yes. So yeah, please, please share with me that material and I'll help, help you with distribution a little bit. Well, I'd love to. Thank you so much. And from a personal standpoint, you know, it's been difficult, obviously, because we're on the corona lockdown, you know, as we're recording this. And so, you know, I haven't been able to play too much. I've played a little bit online, but not too much, you know, live. Obviously, I haven't played it all live um, in, in quite a while. So I am keeping up, you know, I have uh, learning materials that I'm using myself. And so I, I'm, you know, keeping up with that. Um, so it's hard for me to say what my goals would be from a actual, you know, playing standpoint, because right now it's hard to imagine being back, but I know we will be back and believe me, I will be there. So. Yeah. It, I used to talk about it when COVID first went down with my guests because it was like a novel thing. And now it's just reality. <laughs> it's not even right? a thing that gets talked about anymore. It's right? just a way of life that I think we've all accepted um, for better or worse, or well, most of us have accepted, I guess. Well, acceptance is the key, right? Yes, but, acceptance. Uh, maybe is I the should key. maybe I should put that on my third billboard. <laughs> You're gonna run out of money. You need to save that magic wand so that you can start erecting <laughs> uh, more billboards. <laughs> right. <laughs> What's a project you're working on that's near and dear to your heart? I mean, everything I work on is near and dear to my heart, right? But uh, I'm actually working on a micro podcast right now, which is going to be really short. And it's going to have, you know, mindset tips, tricks, things like that. But but I'm planning for it to be like five minutes, say like five to 10 minute long episode. So really short. And uh, so that's what has my focus right now. And I'm pretty excited about it. Awesome. And for what it's worth, I do realize that saying impactful things over the course of five minutes is much more difficult um, than doing it (laughs) over the course of an hour and a half, right? (laughs) Right. Yeah, it's going to be tricky, but but I think I'm up for the challenge. 
and uh, hopefully I can bring forward, you know, some thought provoking ideas in a micro podcast type fashion. So yeah. Does that project that have a name? On. You know, I'm toying with a couple names, so I'm going to definitely have to get back on you. Okay. I don't know what it is, but it feels like naming anything is like the biggest bugaboo. Oh, it is. Creating a title for the podcast mm-hmm. episode, creating a name for this exact podcast. The listener would be shocked if they knew the amount of energy that went into choosing Chasing Poker Greatness. It seems very simple. Like, again, I just rolled out of bed and was like, aha, this is the name. <laughs> but long, laborious process. Um, because once you name it, that's what it is. And right? that's what You're it's going to be with forever. It. Right. So <laughs> screw it up at your own peril. And, you know, in my mind, I'm imagining when I'm winning all the awards and accolades for my good work and they're saying that name and, it, you know, it has to be a good one. <laughs> yeah. And let's go back to first impressions, right? Like right? a name, it, it's a first impression. So if you want people to listen to your thing, you kind of need a little sexy name to go along with it. It's harder than it looks. And, you know, a lot of times I'll think of something real sexy and then I'll go check and see if it's, you know, trademarked or anything like that. And then, of course... Somebody already, you know, will have it, even though they're in a different area, you know, different field. Like, well, okay. It was a good try. It was a good it thought. It was a good try. <laughs> right. Solace right. in the fact so, that, you know, great minds think alike. Yeah, yeah. So that's happened a few times. Cool. So still nameless when you when you lock coming. one down. Yeah, when you lock one down, let me know. And I'll share that with the, you know, on the show page as well with the listener. And final question, where can the Chasing Poker Greatness audience find you on the World Wide Web. You can come over to peakpokermindset.com. That's my training site where I've got some courses, some free things and some paid things over there. You can follow me on Twitter at Dr. Trisha Cardner. You can check out my Facebook group, which is the Poker Mindset Mastery Lab. And uh, yeah, that, that, that's probably about good enough. Yeah. There you go. Check out Dr. Trisha Cardner on social media, the web, all the places you can click through on this show page. Thank you very much for your time and your energy. I have thoroughly enjoyed our conversation. Let's do you know, another round two somewhere down the line when you release a new book or you know, your, pod, your mini podcast, the micro podcast gets up in the air. <laughs> yeah, thanks so much for having me. I really enjoyed talking all things poker and psychological with you. Take care. Bye. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Chasing Poker Greatness. If you have yet to subscribe to the show, please take a second to do so on Apple Podcasts or wherever your favorite place to listen to podcasts may be. For more content from me, Coach Brad, please visit our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash enhance your edge, and I'll see you next time.